Welcome to Real Chemistry. I'm Dr. Morris. What we're going to do today is talk about building up molecular orbital diagrams from atomic orbitals. If you're not sure what a molecular orbital is, go ahead and check out my video, What is a Molecular Orbital, before continuing here. I'll link to that in the show notes below. So, recall that our atoms have their electrons distributed into atomic orbitals. So here's nitrogen, for example. And when we mix each of these atomic orbitals, we can get molecular orbitals. So we're going from how electrons are smeared around an atom to how electrons are smeared around a molecule. So we use atomic orbitals to build these up. And that's what we're going to go through in this video. So here, we're going to build up the diagram that's correct for boron, carbon, and nitrogen. It turns out oxygen and fluorine's diagram is slightly different. And I'll show you what that looks like towards the end of this video. So stick with us. So to get you oriented on what this chart's doing, we have our atomic orbitals here and here. So that's sort of like the before picture. We're thinking about our two atoms separately, and then they're gonna to come together and bond. And that's where we're thinking about our molecular orbitals. So you can really think about the left and right panels as being like before, and the center panel being like after bond formation. One other thing to note before we begin is you notice that the lowest orbital I have drawn here is 2s. I don't have any 1s drawn. The reason is, is that 1s is the core electrons for our nitrogen. And those core electrons don't really contribute contribute any to bonding. So they just sort of stay the same. So if you look at your molecular orbitals at the end of the day, the 1s's don't mix together. They just look like 1s's because they're core electrons. The only electrons that change their orbitals are the valence orbitals. Those are the ones that contribute to bonding. And that's why we neglect the 1s and we just start with the 2s. What can happen when our 2s orbitals mix? Well, they can either have constructive interference between those two wave functions, which increases electron density between the protons and stabilizes the orbital. And we call that bonding, or it can do the opposite, which we'll discuss in a second. So this is bonding when there's constructive interference between our two orbitals. And the way we label that is sigma G. And that G there stands for Girardi, which uh, has to do with the symmetry of those two orbitals when they overlap. Like I said, the 2s orbitals can also, when they approach each other, have destructive interference. That is, they have opposite phases, and that causes destructive interference, and that increases their energy relative to the original orbitals. And the way we label that one is with a sigma still, because it's still actually a sigma-type bond, and then a u, and then an asterisk. The u stands for ungerarde. So, that's the two molecular orbitals we get from our 2s atomic orbitals. Now let's take a look at what the p orbitals give us. It depends, it turns out, on which p orbital you mix, what type of orbital you get. Some of the times we'll get pi molecular orbitals. Some of the times we'll get sigma, which you might remember from organic chemistry, say, or even gen chem, that when you have a triple bond between, say, nitrogen, that one of those bonds is sigma and two of those bonds are pi. And we'll actually see that reflected here in the bonds that are formed. So first Let's go ahead and take a look at the two px orbitals. These guys, you see them as red dots to the right, are coming in and out of the page. So they still have the blue and the red, but you can't see the blue, it's going into the page. So they're coming at each other like this. They're parallel to each other, and they're in uh, the plane coming out of the screen. And when those combine, they're gonna combine like this. So if you imagine my arms being the p orbitals, then my hands are, say, the positive phases of them. And they'll be able to f overlap and have constructive interference at the tops and the bottoms, and they'll turn out to form uh, pi bonds. And there, there's, again, two options. They can constructively interfere or destructively interfere. So this guy is going to come down and form a constructively uh, interfered molecular orbital that's bonding. And actually, 2py is going to do the exact same thing. And that's because 2py is the, has the exact same orientation. Instead of coming out of the page, though, it's in the page. And both of those are going to form pi-type bonds. And so since we're going to be combining 2p orbitals, we get 2 in our molecular orbital diagram picture. And those are both bonding. And we call those now pi... And the symmetry switches, so we actually call this pi u, for reasons that uh, I won't go into right now, but have to do with the symmetry of the p orbital. And again, obviously, 
we're mixing the 2px and the 2py from both sides. I say obviously, maybe that's not so obvious. So the 2px and the 2pys blend together and give us two pi molecular orbitals. And again, they can form bonding or antibonding. So we'll write the antibonding ones up here. And that is both of our molecular orbitals. So here we have our molecular orbitals. There's two of them. Down below, they're labeled pi u. Up above, they're labeled pi g, and now with a star. Let me rewrite that pi g. So don't worry, I know this is getting to be a uh, sort of hideous mess here. I'm going to show you a nice, neat one in a second. But it is nice for you to see it as it's built up. So that's our sigma bonding and antibonding orbital. Again, we see that the antibonding is higher in energy. That's where there's destructive interference between our pi orbitals. And there's only one orbital left that we haven't mixed, and that's the 2pz. The 2pz does something a little different. Now, our two pi orbitals are coming at each other head to head. And so rather than coming at each other like this, they're able to directly overlap. And that means that they actually form a sigma bond. Hence, you get your two pi bonding orbitals and your one sigma bonding orbital. And so these will be uh, lower in energy than the 2pz orbitals when they're bonding. And again, we'll label that sigma. For sigma, the antibonding, or I'm sorry, for sigma, the bonding will always be g. So that's sigma g. Then on the other hand, we can get an antibonding orbital up above. And that goes above the pi, as it turns out. And you couldn't really predict these energy levels. You can always predict that bonding is going to lower the energy and antibonding is going to raise it. But beyond that, predicting the exact energy is uh, something that can only be done with like computational chemistry methods. So here's what we have in a very messy way. Let me highlight our molecular orbitals. We have our top molecular orbital as sigma u star. That's our sigma antibonding orbital that comes from our 2pz. Then we have two pi orbitals that are antibonding, then our one sigma orbital that's bonding, and then our two pi bonding orbitals. Finally, we have our two s orbitals that are mixing. Notice that we started with four atomic orbitals on each side, and we end up getting a total of eight molecular orbitals in the center. Now let's go and take a look at a picture that's not so disgustingly messy. So here's what it looks like. For B2 to N2, we get this distribution of our um, molecular orbitals. And all that remains, if you want to draw the full diagram, is to fill those in with the correct number of electrons. One thing to note, if you look here, you'll notice that the pi falls below the sigma for B2 to N2. And that's true for B2 to N2, but when we go to oxygen and fluorine, those actually flip. So what we're going to see when we go to oxygen and fluorine is this guy's going to drop down below. So as you can see, the sigma molecular orbital now falls below the pi. And that's true for oxygen and fluorine. This turns out to have to do with the shielding of the 2s electrons. Basically, as we go left to right across the periodic table, we're adding more and more protons. Those pull the 2s electrons closer and closer to that nucleus. And we didn't mention this in drawing the molecular orbital diagram, but it turns out that the 2s orbitals mix a little with this sigma guy up here because they have the same symmetry. And because they have the same symmetry, they can mix a little, and that way, that means that as the shielding increases, it can change these energy levels. So the important point to remember is that for oxygen to fluorine, we actually get a shift of our sigma molecular orbital to be below our pi molecular orbital. Thanks for watching this episode of Real Chemistry. If you have any questions, please leave them below. As always, you can click on that Real Chemistry icon to subscribe. Thanks for watching.